everyone. My name is Tina Ruggieri. I am the assistant curator at the Abrams Engel Institute for the Visual Arts, located at the University of Alabama at Birmingham's campus. I'm excited to be here today with artist Aaron Lurie. Aaron was born in 1988 in Kingston, Ontario. She graduated in 2012 with a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the Ontario College of Art and Design University in Toronto. And she also received a Certificate of Advanced Visual Studies from o OCAD's Florence program. Erin's work is abstract in nature and her paintings are bold and experiential. She is interested in the transformation of the image and how the work's meaning shift throughout her process. She facil facilitates an experience for the viewer where multiple truths exist simultaneously within one work. Erin has had exhibitions at galleries and museums such as Tom Thompson Art Gallery in Ontario, Peter Robinson Gallery in Alberta, The Yard in Brooklyn, New York, and Stephen House in Brooklyn, New York, and that is just to name a few. Erin, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. This is awesome. Yeah. So first, I want to ask about your most recent exhibition at Tom Thompson Art Gallery titled The Swirl. Can you walk us through the process of how you came up with the idea for the exhibition and also the inspiration for the title? Sure. Um, I'll just say that it was meaningful on a number of levels. Um, first, it was my first exhibition at a public art gallery, which uh, in itself was a much grander production than anything I've been used to in the past. So Heather McLeese, the curator of contemporary art at the Tom uh, invited me to come look at the gallery's vault last year in June. Mm -hmm. So I went to the space into this secret layer filled with paintings, drawings, artifacts, prints of a number of historic and contemporary Canadian artists, including the group of seven and Tom Thompson, um, whom the gallery is named after. Mm -hmm. And so what we did was First, I went to the vault and intuitively picked out a number of paintings. And then I sat with them for about a month or two and just started writing about them individually and as a group, making connections between them. And <clears throat> slowly things started to come together. Pieces of the puzzle started to fit. And uh, around that time, I was reading an essay by Roald Nasgard. He's... Um, a brilliant writer and um, art critic in Canada. And he wrote an essay called um, Rendering the God Spirit. And it was from the accompanying text for the Mystical Landscapes exhibition at the Art Gallery of Ontario a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And in the essay, he talked about Emily Carr, who she was associated with the Group of Seven, but wasn't an official member. Um, she encountered the Group of Seven's work for the first time and I believe it was 1927. And she talked about their, their impact on her. And it was like, they were messengers from a God that she had been searching for this whole time. So she described Arthur Lismer's work as swirling and sweeping on and Lauren Harris's work as um, moving into serene and uplifted places. Mm -hmm. So I started to think about this idea of the swirl and what this, something about it just hooked me. Yeah. and what it meant. And so my interpretation of it was that the swirl is a state of being. Mm -hmm. And the show for me, uh, the works that I made in response to the um, pieces from the collection that were also exhibited in the show, were exploring what it meant to reside, in the, to be within the swirl and above the swirl simultaneously. So chaos existing at one level and harmony at another. Mm -hmm. So you can see right here, all of the, uh, most of the pieces from the collection that were in the show were shown in a salon style wall. Mm -hmm. And each piece, each piece to me represented, um, which I'll have to talk about because it's kind of multifaceted. Yeah. A piece of the journey moving from, say, darkness to light. So I had, I was thinking about, um, it was, first of all, it was a really long process to narrow down yeah. the works. So I chose, uh, artifacts, prints, drawings, and paintings, obviously, from a number of artists that had been my art heroes, um, like David Milne, Emily Carr, 
Lauren Harris, Arthur Lismer, and Tom Thompson. Um, and basically, I wanted to show different fragments of the journey. So whether it was referenced in the title or the imagery or the relationships between pieces together on the wall. Mm -hmm. And then I'm not sure if you can see it. So, <laughs> okay. So we all was going to ask you about the monarch. So yeah. It's a good okay, opportunity. So I, yes. Okay. So the monarch, but well, the butterfly is a symbol of transformation, transformation, renewal, mm -hmm. um, rebirth. And it's been a, a huge significant creature in my life and I was I w had just recently watched a documentary from 2009 called The Incredible Journey of the Butterflies which described oh. the phenomenal migration path of the monarchs from North America to Mexico every winter um, and it talked about how they have to well, first of all it's an no one really knows still to this day what draws them there and how they get there. If it's yeah. like an inner compass or um, generational like uh, cellular memory or something. But so they have to cross scorching hot deserts, mountain ranges, bodies of water with no land in sight. Um, and they're like the most unlikely creature to make this journey, which is an upward of 3000 miles. So I just thought about this journey of the butterflies as something of immense faith and persistence, perseverance, and it's cyclical mm -hmm. and it's multi-generational. Um, so we spoke with, uh, I forget his position, but at the Royal Ontario Museum, mm -hmm. um, the man who's in charge of the insect specimens. <laughs> so I got to go, I got to go into that vault. Oh, wow. I know it was fantastic and he loves his job um and so you know he had a lot of stories to tell me not just about monarchs but about other insects as well and mm -hmm. um it was really special so i got to choose uh, a number of monarchs two of which so, actually are pardon oh, sorry i was gonna say so this was like a multi-institutional exhibition that you put together yeah yes and it all came together piece by piece so like yeah one exactly so um, two of the butterflies are tagged by Fred Urquhart, who is a, well, he was a Canadian zoologist. Um, and he and his wife discovered the migratory path, oh. um, in the, in the seventies. Yeah. Oh, so wow. it was really, yeah, it's really special that they're in there. Um, so in the installation, you can see the salon style wall on the one edge, one side of the gallery. Mm -hmm. And then in the middle of the gallery is the case full of monarch butterflies, which mm -hmm. appear to be in flight. And then mirroring on the other side is a giant painting. It's nine feet by 15 feet called the swirl right here, <laughs> which, <laughs> it's, which it, also. <laughs> I'm sure this one is just, just super immersive because the size itself, you can't really, unless you're standing in front of it, you just can't get a sense of just how enormous it is. <laughs> totally it was definitely I mean I'm really comfortable working on a large scale normally yeah. but this was just a little bit bigger than I had ever worked and I had to <laughs> set up scaffolding to do it so oh, yeah the process of making it oh so <laughs> the process of making it felt very like stop and go very fragmented and when I'm making a large painting like normally when I make works it's all in one shot it's wet into wet but with the larger paintings I have to do a wet into wet section and then a wet into wet section and somehow find a way to um, connect them all to have them appear as if they came into being at once. Um, and this, this one, be, just because of the nature of the size, really did feel like a really challenging, um, fragmented journey for me. Yeah. And it was all, and I didn't plan this piece, which made it even more challenging. Um, the only thing that I really had an intention of was painting that waterfall, which I wanted to have sort of function as like the, the backdrop or the stage for other mm -hmm. abstract painterly marks to happen from. So I know that the process of making your work is important. Can you go ahead and walk us a little bit through that? And totally. maybe how it changed with this work? Yeah. So, okay. So, Painting for me is really mysterious. Like 
something that works one day doesn't work the next day. And that's what keeps me coming back to the studio. So yeah. it's very elusive in a way. Mm-hmm. And I will say that I'm a monogamous painter. I like to work on one at a time. <laughs> so I, I really like to have a, like a deep love affair or conversation with one painting at a time. Like I've tried to work on a number of pieces at once and I found that they just, the, it, it, they became a bit diluted mm-hmm. and they also ended up looking really similar because I was using the same palette and it, mm-hmm. obviously that's okay depending on my intention, but yeah, I prefer to have each painting um, functioning as its own universe. So I do want it to be self-contained, but at the same time, each painting generates the next painting. So they're all connected through a thread that way. Yeah. And questions that arise in one painting, I get to explore in the next one. Um, like I said, I work normally wet into wet. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of, I use... um all kinds of tools like paint, uh, paint brushes, synthetic and not synthetic, cardboard, screen printing squeegees, homemade squeegees, cardboard, like on palette knives, whatever I can find that can move, mm-hmm. uh, apply paint and remove paint. So I like to work on a rigid surface because a lot of my process is additive, but also reductive. And I tend to dig into the surface um, to remove paint and allow the stain surface to uh, or the white of the panel, at least to shine through the stained colors on the surface. Yeah. Um, and ambiguity is very important. I really want the I really want the viewer to have the same experience that I'm having when I look at my own work, which is something different every time I see it. Because you're bringing your own experiences in that moment and from everything from your past to this one painting, and the meaning and perception of it changes every time. Yeah. And so... Yeah, and so I really want the paintings to um, not be too legible and easily understood. I want them to unfold slowly over time, and I want them to have like an immediacy and an intimacy. Yeah. So I want the image to an image and the color to really, um, to, you know, to 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 draw you in and then I want your, the handling of the material to kind of keep you there, keep you interested. Um, So, so yeah. Yeah. (laughs) This piece. And and, I was going to say that makes sense when you think about the wet into wet, because that's the only way you would get like on this, this painting, for example, the far left, you have those reds, yellows and blues all mixed in together. And that's really the only way you're going to achieve that goal. Um, I guess unless you painstakingly, (laughs) um, (laughs) you know, do it, like one color at a time, but you still wouldn't right. have that quality that you get exactly. when you wet to wet. Um, Absolutely. So um, these are dated for this year. So let's talk yeah. about like some recent developments in your work, but also maybe what yeah. you're working on during quarantine. Absolutely. Okay. So yeah, these paintings are the same size. They're both made from this year uh, within a couple of months of each other. Mm-hmm. But the piece on the right, the is actually um, for the, for the first time I'm starting to paint over top of old paintings that I thought were finished, which I now realize weren't finished and they just needed to be continued. But I had to wait wait for the right time. Um, so I, I obviously I approach a lot of my paintings quite differently. And mm-hmm. um, the painting on the left is called Poet. And um, okay, so this was one of the first pieces where I was exploring. Um, this idea so I love that we are all like all living things are emanating electromagnetic frequencies at all times and so and if you take the heart for example it's like the strongest electromagnetic frequency that emanates from the body and so we're literally immersed in each other's heartbeats at all times so there's this like we're thinking you know sometimes we think that we're individual autonomous beings but the the fact of the matter is on some level, some energetic level or telepathic level, we're communicating with each other. And so I wanted to find a way to visually express this idea of like um, these ripples of energy or light emanating from a central form or central um, section. 
Um, and so I also want my paintings to feel as if have a, a, a glowing light from within them. Mm -hmm. I always think of light as synonymous with life. And so in this, in the piece on the left, um, there's a lot of, you know, I did one layer of these gradients. You can see a green, brown, or rusty orange, yellow, white uh, on the background. And then I layered thick paint over top of that mm -hmm. and started removing a lot of different sections and then wiping it away. So there's a, a lot of different um, applications to remove uh, paint on this piece. Mm -hmm. And I was also thinking like a poet and an artist, uh, like their work having this impact and rippling out in ways that we can't see. That's why I called it poet. Well, that's beautiful. And I mean, in just describing the heartbeats and these electric, I mean, that in itself is very poetic. So um, <laughs> very, it's a very interesting, it's very interesting to hear what you're thinking about <laughs> and how that reflects into your work. It's very, Oh yeah. I should, oh, sorry. <laughs> I should totally mention that I don't work with any references around me at all. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's just the work comes from things I'm reading or watching or yeah. looking at or thinking about at the time. And so when I start a series of paintings, I'm starting with an empty room. Mm -hmm. So the first few paintings are really hard to get into because I had nothing around me to inform them. So as I, as I make the first few, then there's something to work with and then they start informing the next, but it's like a really slow start yeah. to a series that I have. Um, and so this piece on the right um, called Receive, I, yeah, this is, this is something that I've been working on during quarantine um, yeah. for the first, for the first year and a half, or sorry, I mean month and a half of quarantine. I know, it feels uh, like it's been a year and a half. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sorry. For the first <laughs> month and a half of quarantine, I didn't make any oil paintings at all, really, uh, maybe like one or two, but. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like a serious scarcity of materials. Um, I use a lot of paint, obviously, and all the art supply stores closed down and all of the colors that I would normally work with uh, were out of stock or if they were in stock would take a month to get to me. Mm -hmm. So I started like asking myself a lot of really hard questions. Like, how am I being wasteful? How can I be resourceful in the studio? Why do I need to use all this material? And why do I need to make a painting right now? And I felt like, I didn't want to make an oil painting unless I had some real reason to. So I just did a lot of watercolors, which was very therapeutic and it was much more of a meditative uh, process, mm -hmm. which is what I needed at the time. And, um, and so I was sitting in the studio one day and like, I wanted to make a painting, but like I said, I didn't want to waste any materials. Yeah. Um, and then I just started pulling out all of these old paintings that I really w would have thrown in the garbage or, you know, I don't know what I would have done with them, <laughs> stored them <laughs> in indefinitely. Um, and because they were throwaways to me anyways, there's so much, so much more of a willingness to take a risk with them, Yeah, which is something that I'm always trying to do anyways, but it was just very evident in this specific process that there was nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I've always been really, a, a, I've had an aversion to painting on textured surfaces. Mm -hmm. um, I normally paint on really smooth, wet sanded panels, um, but something just clicked this time and I started seeing the, the value in the slow building of something. Mm -hmm. And then I started seeing my entire practice in a new light. So um, these, these older paintings that I, like again, I thought they were finished, are coming back into my life Mm -hmm. They're teaching me something. So there's this, now I'm seeing that it's much more cyclical yeah. than I thought. And there are threads that weave in and out of, of my practice. And um, it's also amazing to know now that I don't have to get it right the first time. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I can relate to that, that statement. Um, you, I have a tendency to want to do everything right the first time. Yeah, um, But it sounds like, <laughs> In a way, even though obviously quarantine is not always has not always been positive, but you had you were able to spend this time and be very reflective on your practice and mm -hmm. maybe in a way have a little bit of a breakthrough with your own work. Totally. I'm not the only one. I have every, yeah. almost every artist I've talked to has had a similar experience. Yeah. Um 
and like it's like in the beginning you know the stress and the chaos of everything yeah. sort of suppressed creativity and then at some point something new emerges and also you know being pulled out of the hustle and all of these deadlines are now non-existent because yeah. everything's been canceled yeah. it's like we get it yeah it's like we get a chance to return to this more like childlike curious um way of creating something mm -hmm. and it's been really special um so I'm I'm really grateful for this I don't think this would have happened well that that's yeah. actually really wonderful to hear and <laughs> I mean, honestly, it's really nice to hear because I have spoken to several artists that have had their own break. Like you said, many people have had breakthroughs or have looked at their practice differently or created a new series. Or even though in the beginning it was kind of tough to get your creative juices going, but then yeah. somewhere, you know, artists, you'll have this deep need to create. That's just what yes. makes you an artist. And so <laughs> yeah. able to, everybody's been able to pull through and make some really incredible work. Um, Absolutely. I Something people always want to know is just how you became interested in art. So I want to kind of take it sure. a step back and just start maybe where did this interest in becoming an artist or being interested in art come from? Sure. Um, I, I mean, I think becoming an artist happens in a lot of different ways for people. For me, it was just I was born that way. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> it just is a classic case of like a, as soon as I could hold a crayon, I was making art and um I'm lucky that it was uh, really nurtured in me. My my dad is an incredible artist and musician, mm -hmm. and my mom's also very creative and musical. So, um, as well as a lot of my aunts and uncles um, and cousins. <laughs> but um, so, <laughs> so my it's in the family. <laughs> yeah, and my dad. Um, actually, I just talked to him the other day because he's moving across the country next month. So we were having uh, like a reconnecting visit, and he was mm -hmm. telling me that when I was younger, my mom was at work and he he just played gigs at night so he spent every day with me um as a young girl and he we would draw together mm -hmm. on pieces of bristol board every day for hours oh wow every day and he taught me <laughs> like he taught me how to observe things around me and to break them down down into simple shapes and translate them into my own work and he also is super hilarious and he was always drawing a lot of like comics and cartoons yeah. so he taught me how to be more inventive in a different way as well so I yeah. think that yeah so that was definitely nurtured in me from from the beginning and I I spent many many years until my last year of university doing realistic figurative work oh wow um <laughs> what happened was um and I so for the past for the two years leading up to the transition to this work mm -hmm. I felt like an extreme restlessness like it was like uh, I was so dissatisfied with my work but I didn't know what to do and I was like dipping my toes in abstraction but always combining the figure in the work in some way mm -hmm. um, and I just couldn't let go to working with like using an image and a reference and I I was really attached to the image and making it look exactly like um, the source material so in that sense there was no room for spontaneity or chance yeah. or discovery in the process it was only about execution and is so that why you don't typically have source material around you now is because that was part of an old process yeah and I'm sure like I might come back to it like everything <laughs> I do now is just who knows what's gonna happen like I exactly. really believe that <laughs> I'm totally I'm really yeah I'm really open to whatever uh, calls to me and so far every time I try something other than painting it just reinforces the fact that I want to paint yeah. so it's um <laughs> but so what happened was, was like a few days before my final year at OCAD which is your most important year of your undergrad obviously because you're building a body of work with based on research and it's very self-directed um so a few days before that I broke my foot um, my third metatarsal and I had crutches for the whole first semester because my bone just didn't heal oh, that so cool. I mean again it's like <laughs> in a way it's like the quarantine it was a huge gift in disguise mm -hmm. um, because I had never slowed down or taken a pause in my life mm -hmm. um, long enough to really I don't know confront aspects of myself that I had been running away from and um, so I had to 
<laughs> really surrender to the experience. Like, you know, I couldn't, everything that I had thought I was going to do that year just went right out the window. I couldn't build my own strainers or stretchers, stretch my own canvas. I couldn't gesso myself. I couldn't stand up to paint, carry a coffee, buy art supplies. I literally had to rely on help for everything, which was, you know, it was really tough. And, but it was amazing because I started seeing just from my own perspective of being physically limited for four months, like I started seeing that around me everywhere. So I started having this like understanding of like, just what I hadn't noticed in the world was going on. And um, I think that over the course of the four months, um, a lot of tension had just built up and I started making a lot of these small self portraits, like dozens and dozens and dozens of them. And they started to loosen up a lot. And I was looking at artists like, um, like George Kondo, Cecily Brown, Auerbach, like Marlene Dumas and, because I was also in a pretty dark place. <laughs> and looking at <laughs> looking at artists that were trying to capture the essence of a person rather than the the likeness of someone. Yeah. And then as soon as my cast came off, I I feel like the same week I just decided to give up reference photos. Um mm -hmm. and I just dove into um color in a way that I'd never done before. I think I was afraid of paint and color before that. Mm -hmm. And the from that point on it became about the process of making something and the uncertainty of, of the work and yeah. um, just sort of uh, finding value in the unknown. And it, it was fun from that day on. I had never had fun before. So oh. like, I'm really grateful for that. Sometimes it's um, the, cause we live in such a fast paced world. Like everything is go, go, go. And I think that's yeah. been one of the positives of COVID. And it sounds like that's, you're saying is one of the positives of when you broke your foot is that it's Absolutely. forcing you to slow down and to observe yeah. and to be more mindful of what you're doing. And Absolutely. that's something that I've learned during COVID as well is, um, is we don't have to be go, go, go all the time. We can take a step back, take a breather and really think. And, um, yeah. sounds like that has been the breaking point for you. So I know that you just mentioned <laughs> color and so a lot of your work is very vibrant with rich, beautiful colors. So I just want you to maybe touch a little bit about your vibrant color palettes because they are just, let's go to like this one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. Okay. I, first of all, I have a lot to say about this painting besides <laughs> the color. But um, yeah. so, okay. So for me, form follows color. So whenever I feel stagnant in my practice or... I feel like the compositions or imagery is becoming very predictable. Like mm -hmm. I will go out and buy uh, different colors that I've never used together before. Mm -hmm. um, and it always changes something and something unpredictable always happens when I change the color palette. Um, so I'm always using color to create um, tension and a sense of vibration and energy and um uh, yeah, so color is something that I really love to explore. So I also have these, I always have small panels lying around where I will use the leftover paint that I've scraped off of paintings and then I'll create uh, these like in-between paintings with these sort of muddier, um, more muted color palettes, mm -hmm. uh, which is also like, it's just a way to challenge me to, you know, work with materials that I'm not used to working with. And like I is said, that always changes. Is this yeah, that's one, one of them. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and I'm, <laughs> uh, so I also made a body of work a few years ago um, called, or a couple of years ago called uh, Shadow of a Hole. And so at a, at a certain point in my practice, I felt like I might have been using color as a crutch. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to see if I could create paintings that, um, you know, elicited an emotional response without color and yeah. its associations and so I did a series of monochromatic paintings um, using a chromatic black that I mixed plus white. I never measured the different colors that I was using to mix with the black so when I painted the painting had its own hue so that each each piece had a different hue and temperature mm -hmm. which I found really interesting like some were warmer some were cooler mm -hmm. um, and then it became about how do I 
create a compelling painting through image and surface mm -hmm. um, and the handling of material alone without color and uh, working with a, a greater range of value. Um, but then it like, again, it just reinforced my desire to use color. So, yeah. but I think it's, but I do think it's always a it really, I mean, it's important to me to, um, to create challenges or constraints within my practice that yeah. help me to grow within those limitations. Um, and yeah. And so this, this piece right here called Fantasia two is from another, another series where, um, I introduced some constraints, um, which was I made a series of pairs and trios of paintings. Mm -hmm. So an eternal struggle that I have is whether I should be planning my paintings more or I should just totally work intuitively. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to make a series where I investigated the relative benefits of planning and not planning. And so the first painting in the pair or the trio was totally unplanned mm -hmm. um and then the second painting at first was an attempt to replicate the first one <laughs> um which was a really interesting exercise because i i'm not really sh i don't really know how i'm making a painting while i'm making it and i'm not you know analyzing you know this stroke came first that stroke came second yeah um so then when i went to go make the second one i really had to break it down in my mind first mm -hmm. um and then, so what was interesting was just what happened between the two paintings. It wasn't the the final outcome. And it was always the first painting that was more successful than the second painting, except for in this pair. So this is the second <laughs> second piece of a large pair. So it's five feet by 13 feet long. It's um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> So, okay, the way that I typically, I'm bearing off topic about the color, but. No, it's okay. Um, I, I want, you're kind of getting into the idea of the series. And so I find that, yeah. um, which I want you to touch on a little bit. Totally. Um, so, okay. Yeah. So I also made a series of, I think maybe there are four or five paintings in that body of work where um, I played with how I can translate the feeling of one painting in different scales mm -hmm. so I made one piece that was like three by three and a half feet mm -hmm. and then I moved up to like uh like up in scale and then down in scale and then really up in scale so I shifted around a lot like yeah. non-linearly um the, the paintings were called a uh, peace of mind on a mountainside so I just wanted to see if I could translate that feeling of like standing on top of a mountain or a lookout and just that like this like moment of like relief and calm um, on different scales. And um, also at this, at this time of making this body of work, I discovered that, um, which maybe I should have known, but I just, I didn't know that Matisse had also started working uh, serially when he mm -hmm. turned 30. And that was the same year that I started making these works as well. So, um, and he never intended for his works to be shown together. Mm -hmm. um, he was always just searching for like, different visual solutions um, to the same problem, but yeah. also trying to get to a deeper truth in the painting. Mm -hmm. um, but but again, they were they were shown together just you yeah. know in recent years. But um, so I just thought that was really interesting that you know there's this like collapsing of time. Like we're we're, we're working with the same materials, and we're inevitably going to encounter the same challenges and ask yeah. the same questions and so I felt like it was a moment of reassurance for me like I'm, I'm on the right path yeah. in my career when yeah. I yeah <laughs> it was it was really nice <laughs> um so you had started to say that this this painting that we're looking at on the screen Fantasia oh yeah King, was the more successful painting from this series can you explain to us why it might have just been, well, actually, when I made the first painting, I was really sick. So uh, it felt very unrefined and rough. Like I was, I really struggled through it. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that, and it, I mean, it's a matter of perception, right? Like for me, yeah. this feels more successful because I've just decided to um, 
maybe refine certain forms in a way that I wasn't able to in the first one or something. Yeah. So who knows whether what, what, yeah. <laughs> what one is more successful or not. But so like, um, so I always start on the right hand side for a large painting mm -hmm. and then I'll start moving towards the left and then I'll jump over to the left. And then mm -hmm. what I love about this process is that I am then, <laughs> and then I have to find a way to connect these two seemingly, you know, disconnected sections. Mm -hmm. Um, which I find really exciting. And this Fantasia means like a, a composition made of many different styles and improvisations. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's obviously, you know, that Disney movie was a huge, I watched it every day as a child. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so I love that, you know, a painting can be made in these sort of fragmentary, like non-linear uh, mm -hmm. way, but it can appear to have a very um, like, linear to be read in a really linear yeah. way so sense. there's just a uh, yeah um many different approaches to painting that I um tried in this piece like uh under the yellow mound mm -hmm. um I had I was playing around with different drying times with the paint so I made one painting and then I let it dry for a few days and then scraped it off and so some of the paint had already dried and then I would paint another painting let it partially dry scrape that away and then I did that a few more times mm -hmm. um whereas some of the paint some of the sections are just like a la prima that's it yeah. or some of it's been wiped away like the hand has been wiped away right back down to the canvas so we've seen like several different examples of series and so here's another one sacred well mm -hmm. from Snake and ladder series can you get into um like why working as in a series is important to your work or how do you determine that it's going to be a series? Yeah. So I typically don't work in series. Okay. It's kind of a hard question because I think that I'm a lot of, it's, it's a lot of things are changing for me right now in terms of how I'm, like I said, mm -hmm. how I'm, how I'm seeing that old works weren't finished. So what I'm realizing in my studio is that there are, multiple bodies of work that are happening on different timelines mm -hmm. so um which i which i'm now seeing is such a valuable um way of working so i have like these certain paintings that are kind of misfits but they all go together and then certain paintings that just require many many years of layering and then i'm seeing that there are multiple things happening at the same time but that just take different time frames um, the reason why I like working in series is because it gives the work a little bit of a direction. Like I work intuitively without a plan. Um, it all begins and ends on the canvas or the panel. Mm -hmm. But if I have like a general overarching idea to begin with, then I just naturally sort of work within that, um, or under that umbrella. Mm -hmm. And I like to leave it really open. Like, um, the snakes and ladders, the snakes and ladders idea came from, um, I just had this idea one day to look up the history of the, the board game, snakes and ladders. Oh. Have you played it? I, I mean, I have, but it's been like, since I was a child, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I used to play it all the time. Yeah. Like, every day. <laughs> and I, I had this, like, I was like, what is that? What is it? Where did it come from? What does it mean? So, yeah. um, I, it, turns out that it originated in ancient India and it was actually called the game of knowledge and it was a way to teach um, Hindu morals and values to children so no idea yeah so the so the original game like a, for people that don't know this game there are snakes and ladders and if you hit the, the tail of a snake you have to slide down if you hit the bottom of a ladder you get to advance up um, but in the original game there were more snakes than ladders, which shows me that there's an inherent struggle and challenge in the wisdom to attain um, enlightenment, which is what they were teaching, but also mm -hmm. in the painting process itself in life. Like painting to me is only valuable insofar as it can teach us about living mm -hmm. um, and vice versa. And so I started, you know, seeing similar patterns in the way that that I, that I make a painting it's cyclical non-linear mm -hmm. um that's exactly what happens in the game of snakes and ladders yeah um so there's this really this real emphasis on 
the nonlinear nature of progress. So for example, ideas are born out of what I'm reading or think, yeah. talking about. Um, and then they just evolve into something usually that I couldn't have predicted. So you're revisiting works that you thought were finished. So yeah. I guess now you're starting to reevaluate the way you look at a finished work. And absolutely. So how, um, how is that changing for you? And so <laughs> my original question was really going to be like, how do you determine when a work is finished? But now mm -hmm. you're trying to reevaluate that. Um, is it um, a feeling? Is it intuitive? Is it planned? <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> um, Philip Gustin talks a lot about um, this recognition of an image. So like when you arrive at the final stage of a painting, um, there's this recognition in which the painting feels at once familiar and um, new. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's lived inside you for a long time, but it still surprises you. Mm -hmm. And um, that's kind of the feeling. That is the best way of describing it that I've yeah. ever come across. Um, I also, you know, when I finish a painting, I know I finished it because it stops talking to me. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like they communicate with you and they need and ask things of you. And as soon as it just stops talking, yeah, it becomes its own it's almost like, you know, like you have a child and like at some point you're like, wow, like it's its own thing now. Like yeah. I, and also, um, you know, like a, when I look at a finished painting, my eye isn't drawn to a specific area or section. It just like hovers over the whole thing as one. Mm -hmm. So that's also like, if your eyes repeatedly drawn to a certain spot, like it's not done. Yeah. And that's I've very to much like, <laughs> an intuitive process for you and what is specific to your practice. So it's not necessarily yeah. something like me coming into your studio and telling you, Oh, this work is not finished or this work is right. Finished. Very much right. a personal interaction and discussion between yeah. you and the process. Absolutely. Um, yeah. One other thing that I want to talk to you before we're finished is sure. so you work in a variety of sizes. You have enormous yeah. size works and you mentioned that you've been doing watercolors. And so yeah. um, why is it important for you to work in a variety of sizes and materials to like to show your ideas and themes? Well, I see, I'm always, I always want to feel like a beginner mm -hmm. in my process. Um, I want the work to teach me something Mm -hmm. um, I never want to assume too much control over the painting and I want to have the opportunity for it to tell me what it needs. And so by alleviating some of that control, like, the best way to do that for me is to switch things up as often as I can so mm -hmm. that my process on a certain size or with a certain material doesn't become too predictable yeah. and form and formulaic because it can. Um, and so that's why I tend to work on uh, like a, a small, a really small painting. And then immediately after I'll do that 15 by nine <laughs> foot painting. <Yeah. laughs> really trying to clear a loop with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and same thing, you can get comfortable working on a large scale or a small scale. So, yeah. and with one medium. And so, uh, and I, I like, I like seeing how, my work translates in different materials. So um, that's why, you know, working uh, working in a, uh, an oil painting and then a drawing and then a watercolor. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, something that I discover in the watercolor will then feed into the oil paintings. And so, yeah, yeah I love that about, about that, that <laughs> process. <laughs> well, I want to thank you for your time today. It's been really lovely speaking with you. I have enjoyed getting to know your work. Um, it's, it's wonderful work and I can't wait to see more. Thank you so much, Tina. Yeah, this has been so wonderful. <laughs> Thank you.